Welcome to Creeping It Real. I am Judah. This morning, before I came to work, I sat down and I watched a horror movie called The Monster Club. Not to be confused with The Monster Squad, which I kind of enjoy. I mean, on a rewatch recently, I didn't like it as much as I did as a kid, but I still kind of enjoyed it. But this is not about The Monster Squad. This is about The Monster Club a 1981 film, an anthology, starring Vincent Price. For starters, I'm not always a big fan of anthologies. We recently did Cat's Eye, and I felt that that one was more entertaining than this. Okay, so basically, there's this writer, a horror... This is how the movie starts. By the way, this is all spoilers. All spoilers. It starts off with uh, like a, a view of a street and you see a bookstore and there's a display in the bookstore and it's displaying an author and some of his books. He, it's, the author is a horror author. And uh, it just so happens the actual author is standing there looking at the display. I don't know, kind of slightly pondering his life or what have you. Then he starts to walk away, and he runs into Vincent Price, who's looking very just like, uh, I don't know, like he's not having the best of times. And uh, the author's like, hey, what can I do for you? Can I help you? And Vincent's like, oh, I'm just, I'm so hungry. I haven't eaten in days. And the author's like, well, okay, well, let's take care of this. I'll go get you some food. And Vincent's like, I, I can't, I can't keep it down. It just, I, I can't keep it down. And the author's like, well, you know, if there's anything I could do for you, kind of, kind of in a sense of, well, I offered to feed you, yeah, but you can't keep it down. So I, so I don't know what to, to offer you. And he's like, but if there was anything I could do, I would. And Vincent's like, really? And he's like, yeah, well, turns out Vincent is a vampire. So he, uh, <laughs> he essentially, uh, attacks this author and drinks his blood. And uh, then we cut to Vincent kind of doing a little dab on his face. And he's like, oh, thanks. I really appreciate it. Your your blood was so tasty. And the author, not so much horrified, just kind of like, wow, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't expect that. And, you know, I, when I said I'd do anything, I did, didn't necessarily, he didn't, he's not saying this, but the look on his face is like, I didn't necessarily mean that. And he, he's also kind of freaking out uh, about like, oh, am I going to become a vampire now? Which this is the first kind of weird thing about this movie is they kind of come up with their own uh, lore. This is really the only like thing I've ever heard uh, referred to this before. Vince is like, oh, don't worry. I didn't bite you deeply. The only way you can become a vampire is if I give you a, a really good deep bite and I didn't. So don't worry about it. I, I, I bit you lightly. And the guy's like, okay, but I, I, I better not turn into a vampire. Anyway, Vincent's very uh, thankful that he willingly gave up his blood, willingly, out of ignorance. And he's like, I want to do something for you in return. And the author is just kind of like, I'm, I'm ready to be done with this interaction. Just let me go. Vincent's like, no, no. Uh, I can reward you with material for your next book. And so then the author's kind of like, hmm, hmm, maybe I should uh, see about this. And he's like, okay, how are you going to do this? And he's like, well, let me tell you about this secret club. It's called the Monster Club. Get it? Monster Club? So he takes them to the Monster Club and almost immediately the, the doorman's like, you can't bring a human in here. He didn't so much verbalize it, but with the way he looked. And Vincent's like, oh no, he's with me, he's cool. They sit down, Vincent orders some, uh, some type O blood, the generic blood, uh, type O. And then he starts to explain, yeah, we, we can't sustain ourselves on drinking stored blood, especially O. It's, it's kind of just like junk food. It's like for us, to sustain a, for us to sustain ourselves, we have to take straight from the source. Okay, so they kind of 
at least covered up that little bit of plot hole. Like, well, if you were starving, why didn't you just go to the Monster Club and get yourself a glass? Oh, and they give a glass of uh, tomato juice to the author. Now, <laughs> uh, they're kind of talking. Again, this is an anthology, and anthologies always have some kind of a co connective material to bring all of the stories together. So Vincent and this author are going to be the facilitators for the actual stories. In this club, the Monster Club, on the back of the wall, which is, this is so weird now that I think about it. On the back of the wall is this, this painting of not what you would call a family tree, but almost like a, you know, a, almost like a, a Darwin type uh, graph of, well, this, this was first and, and this branched off to this and, and this evolved into that. So here, here, and this, this kind of bothered me, honestly, up at the top, Vincent says, these are the, th the three almost like pure purebreds of the monsters everything all the other monsters come based off of the vampire the werewolf and the ghoul this almost immediately just rubbed me the wrong way because i'm like no 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 there are far more purebred monsters than just those and then he goes on to explain how when like the vampire mates with a ghoul, you get this one type of thing. And when a werewolf mates with a ghoul, you get this other. And when you get the werewolf and the vampire mating, you get something. And then when you have that thing that mates, you know, with something else. So this whole thing is about different versions of different uh, hybrids coming together and uh, their offspring being something. We got this one down here that is what our first story is about. So this, this story, um, Vincent talks about, let's see, he says, he says something like vampires, vampires bite, werewolves hunt and ghouls eat. I, this, he says something along those lines. And he, and he kind of gives uh, an example of other things in this this author is like, well, what does the, the Shadmok do? And he's like, oh, the, the Shadmok whistles. What do you mean? And, he's, and Vincent goes, well, Shadmoks are very rare. And people who hear the whistle almost never live to explain what has occurred. And he says, but there is one man that has experience, but he's locked up in a mental, mental hospital. And he's about the only person you'd ever be able to talk to to find out what a Shadmok whistle does. So this is where we begin. We have a, a human couple. They see this ad in the paper about like an antique collector needing somebody to come help him look at everything, label it, write it down, and all that kind of stuff. So the boyfriend, husband, we don't know, is like, you need to go. You need to see what kind of antiques this guy's got. And then at the right time, we'll break into his place and we'll rob him. She goes for this interview and she sees him. She's immediately like horrified at the way he looks, which he's, he's not, that. <laughs> honestly, he's not that bad. I've, I've seen worse in the real world. And she's like, I won't go back. Her abusive boyfriend is like, you gotta go back. This will be our last big score. So she keeps playing it up. This Shadmok falls in love with her. This is a sad story. He falls in love with her. He asks her to marry him. And she, she goes back. She's like, I can't do this anymore. By the uh, persuasion of the husband, boyfriend, she accepts the Shadmok's marriage proposal. He wants her to meet his family. He has this big party at his home. She's getting passed around to dance. <clears throat> she kind of gets lost in the crowd. And at that moment, she takes off. And she goes to the hidden safe, opens it up, steals money. She's going to run away with all the money. Then the Shadmok comes in and he sees her. He's heartbroken. He's like, why? And she's like, you're horrible. You're hideous. I would never marry you. Anyway, he starts to whistle. She goes home, but they never show her. It's always like she's covered with a cloak or whatever. She goes to her husband, boyfriend. He opens up the door and she just walks into a corner and he's like, did you get the money? Did you get the money? She's not saying anything. And then she takes her cloak off and she turns around and her face is just like, her face is just 
all melted and gross. You can't even, her eyes are gone, which how did she make it home? I don't know. And she's like, will you still love me? I think she ends up dying because I think she continues to melt as she's standing in front of him. Either way, she's she's definitely not having a great life after that. And she looked far worse than the Shadmok. Let me rate it. I'm, I'm giving this a four. It wasn't hideous, but I would never watch it again. It, and I wasn't entirely entertained. The in-between scenes seemed more like when, when they were in the Monsters Club, you know, they would show a full performance by the band at the club doing a full song and each song was a different performer but it got for me it got old real fast as an example a recent example like the movie trap where m night has his daughter as the uh, pop star and they're playing full songs at the concert doing full performances of several songs and as you know you're just sitting there like okay can we get on with the movie and stop watching this music video the the second story is about vampires it's <laughs> uh they try to play it off like you like you're just watching a normal husband wife and their one child the wife and the child love the dad he's he's a good dad you can just tell he's a good dad he's a little pale though and, uh, you know, he, he, he works a night job. He works a night job, guys. And the son and the wife are, are sad to see him, him go to his night job. And his dad just gives him some really weird advice to his son. Never trust a man carrying a violin case. And the, the wife's like, I, I don't think there's any need to go into that. Life is good. We don't need to, we don't need to think about those kind of things. Freaking mafias after these guys. This this kid is bullied by children. Uh, there's the <laughs> they're all gathered around him. Oh, this is horrifying. I can't imagine this ever happening. Like the whole school is just like surrounding this kid, like pressed up. First of all, give me some freaking space here, people. But they're like all up in his business, making fun of him for no reason other than the fact that he's new. And there's like some kind of challenge going on at the same time. There's like this small mud puddle and kids are running and jumping over the mud puddle. And one of the sick burns that they use on this kid is, I bet you can't even jump over that puddle. <laughs> I'll show you. And he, and then I swear this puddle, obviously I'm joking. This puddle is teeny. This It's not a big puddle, like maybe legit, maybe like a three foot puddle. This kid runs and he jumps and he barely makes it halfway and just lands in the puddle and everybody's like, yeah, stupid money, muddy shoe face, dumb, dumb head, poopy breath. Through all of this, there's like this parishioner who's watching and you're just like, what's up with this weird, creepy, creepo checking out these kids? I guess it's kind of on par. And then a teacher comes. He's all pissed off. You know, he, he doesn't come to the kid's rescue. No, but he's mad at him because now he's got mud on his shoes. How dare you, you dumb mf -er. I should beat you. This church type person, the person who looks like he's some kind of like a, a vicar or a father, who, who knows, comes up to the kid and he's like, why do those kids pick on you? And he's like, I don't know. I don't know. They're just mean. But you know what? I'm of royalty. And he's like, what do you mean you're of royalty? He's like, yeah, my dad's a a count and my mom's a countess so that makes me something special and this guy's all like a, a count you say what does your father do i don't know he has a night job and he just sleeps all day in the basement that's not weird so then you start getting the feeling aha this parishioner he is a monster hunter so him and his group of guys get together and they follow this kid home Mom takes off to do some shopping. They bust in. They're like, show us where your dad is at. And he's like, no. They go downstairs. And uh, they find the vampire and they stake him. Oh, my gosh. You know what? Speaking of, you guys are just going to have to hang on just for a second. I got to find this. Okay, let me set this up for you. <clears throat> they find the vampire, these monster hunters. And they have just now, they have just now put the spike on him. And they, <laughs> and they're driving it in. Check out the reaction. This is hilarious. <laughs> He's just, he just now, 
he just now feels it. What? What the heck? What, what the heck? What was that? <laughs> if there was ever a delayed reaction, that was it. Holy smokes. Once again, spoilers. With his dying breath, the vampire grabs a vampire killer and he bites his neck. Once again, confirming this weird little piece of like a uh, vampire lore. Then the wife cackles. <laughs> he took a deep bite. Now you're one of the vampires. She did not have a witch voice at all. I don't know why I gave her that. <laughs> so the two dudes, the two dudes with this, uh, the head vampire hunter, they look at each other and like, she's right. You know, we're going to have to kill you, <laughs> which then this like three stooges type scene occurs and they kill him. <laughs> and they take him off. Uh, it's a happy ending for the vampire family, though, because uh, the vampire slayers leave. They go back downstairs to mourn the father. And he's like, ta-da! I was wearing a steak-proof vest because I'm amazing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they get to live their happy lives after that. <laughs> uh, the last one, the last episode was about this uh, movie producer who wanted some good place to shoot his next movie. He finds a small village, goes there, and he's like, hey, I, I'd love to uh, shoot my movie here. It turns out it's just a, a village of ghouls. They uh, F up his car. He can't drive away. They capture him. He, he runs into uh, this, this cross. I can't even remember what the... I'll put this back up. This thing right here is called a humgu, <laughs> humgu, which is like a cross between a, a human and a ghoul, I think. So, but she's more human than ghoul. She doesn't have to uh, feed on flesh to survive. She is talking to him, and he wants to help her. She wants to help him. They're escaping. You think they're making it, and... There's some kind of a weird, uh, like, boundary these ghouls can't cross. There's, like, some kind of a fog that they can't go through. Uh, they both run through the fog, but as they're running through, one of the ghouls chucks this rock, and it hits the girl. And she's all like, oh, I can't make it. You go on. And he's like, no, I'm going to get help. And so he runs to the bypass, and he waves down these cops. And he's like, hey, guys, there's this uh, this village up here who's got my he, he completely does. He's n no. He forgets about this girl. He doesn't say anything about, hey, come with me. Help me get this girl. She's hurt really bad. What does he say? Hey, there's this village where my car is at. Can you help me get my car? The cops are like, yeah, no problem. We'll take you to the police station. Well, surprise, surprise. They don't take him to the police station. What do they do? They take him back to the village. They drive past the girl on the side of the road and say, hey, there's that girl that I totally forgot about that said I was going to get help for. And they're like, yeah, don't worry about her. We got it taken care of. They drive him to the village, and he's like, what are you doing? This is the village. And the cops turn around, and they smile. And then you see, oh, no, they were ghouls the whole time. The whole time they were ghouls. Let me just show you this. This was the extent of the monsters in the club. All of them were wearing spirit Halloween masks. It was really disappointing. I was not impressed whatsoever. Uh, the practical effects were not at all good. The melting of the woman's face, that was not bad, but all the rest of it was really poor, like what I just showed you a second ago. Let me give you a little bit of uh, some uh, information here about the actual movie. It had a budget of $1.7 million. I have no idea what it grossed, though. It had a small theatrical release in Europe but they could not find distribution for the U.S. So that actually ended up getting picked up for TV and was first run on the Elvira show. I can't remember what her show was called, Mistress of Darkness. There we go. So even though this movie did not have theatrical, theatrical release here in the States, there actually seems to be a huge clamor for collectibles. There was a, a merch tie-ins. There was like a, an album 
for the soundtrack that was released. There was some kind of a graphic novel uh, that was released at some kind of a festival. There's only a thousand copies. And apparently these things, the album and this, this booklet are highly sought after and they go for thousands of dollars. To me, I just find that really funny that there, that this movie is highly sought after. It seems strange to me because it really didn't do a whole lot for me personally. I would like to know if you've seen this movie, am I going to recommend it? Gosh, I don't know. If, if you're like a horror fan, kind of like I am, and you just find yourself burning through movies and running out of things to watch, then yeah. And if you, if you like those kind of, uh, like I said, 1981 era type stuff that have the, uh, the old horror greats in it, like Vincent Price, then, you know, this, this is probably for you. For people who like more modern stuff, this, this probably is not for you. Which one thing I was thinking as I was watching this, movies back in the 70s and kind of the early 80s, they did not have a problem with having um, old people starring in their movies. From what I read when this movie released... It was Vincent Price's 70th, 70, it was his birthday and he was turning 70. Uh, but anyway, movies in that time didn't have a problem featuring old people as the stars. Whereas now, it's, it's not entirely common to have movies around old people. They, you know, they usually want them... Uh, you know, if they, if they have somebody in their 40s or 50s, you better be freaking gorgeous. Uh, that's about the only way. But in my opinion, the, the older people they're using back then were not particularly attractive. But they, they didn't have a problem having whole movies fashioned around these upper middle aged or over the hill people. And I, I find it weird that things have changed so dramatically. Uh, have anybody out there noticed that? Um, or am I just making this stuff up? Anyway, that's my thought on the monster club. Not fantastic. I would only recommend it to horror fans that really are looking for stuff still new things to watch. And when I say new, it's, it, I'm just mean it's something you've never seen. The stories are not necessarily original. Everybody has uh, seen a movie where somebody was trapped and they run into somebody who's in a difficult situation and they want to help each other get out. Uh, we've all seen vampire movies that are comical. I mean, it's, it's really nothing different. We, we've all seen... Movies where somebody falls in love with a person, but that person is just a scammer. We All, all of these stories are not original. Uh, but I didn't feel like I wasted my time. But again, also, the, one of the things that keeps me from saying that I felt like I wasted my time is I'm able to make a review of it. And so that was one of my goals. Watch something so I can do a review. So obviously I didn't waste my time because I got a review out of it. I am Judah. This is Creeping It Real. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.